Hi everyone, and welcome to the second part of our video series on partial differential equations. Um, we have learned in the first video how PDEs are very important, and well, they model physical phenomena like heat transfer or aerodynamics, uh, chemical and physical processes and so on. So it's a very broad class of equations. And we have also learned about a lot of differences and, and challenges in comparison to ordinary differential equations. Right? The main difference is that they depend on space and time as, as free variables. So it's a distributed system usually, the temperature distribution in a house for instance. Um, then what we need to consider is boundary conditions, right? What are the walls of my room? Uh, what's the temperature there, for instance? And then we have seen, well, the problem is due to this distribution, we have an infinite dimensional state. Instead of for ODEs, we have a finite dimensional state. And before we continue in the videos three and four, we will discuss a little bit about numerical solution of these systems. And we will also see uh, program code and also animations, how solutions look over time. I would like to go a, a little bit, take a small detour and discuss the derivation of these systems. For ODEs, we have seen, for instance, um, the, the, the apple falling from a tree or the mass spring damper system, that you can use first principles and derive these equations. And I would like to show you in a very short amount of time how this can be done in a very similar fashion for PDEs as well. Right? We saw you know, Newton's law gave rise to, to these mechanical equations and we will see here the, the law of energy conservation will give us the rules according to which the heat equation develops. So let's do this again for this very simple example. Right? We have this elongated rod of length L and um, a diameter A, or the area is A, small diameter in comparison to the length. So what we're really interested in is only one coordinate. Right? We assume the temperature is constant over this cross section because it's so small in comparison to the length. And what we would like to derive now is, given I apply some temperature at the left side and some temperature on the right hand side, what is the temperature distribution over time going to be? And I'm going to use um, mathematics or physics laws to do so. Um, again, this is a little bit in contrast to what this course is actually about. Um, this is just to give you the, the mathematics side of things. And we will then later transition into the, the data science perspective on these systems where we also see that system knowledge is something that is very useful even though uh, data becomes more and more important. All right, so how do we do this? Um, I said we need sort of conservation laws and before we can get there, let's go back to Fourier, roughly 200 years. In 1822, he postulated that the amount of heat stored in a, in a body, let's say this is now this cylinder, um, is proportional to the temperature, okay? So what was postulated is that the amount of stored heat which we denote by Q is proportional to, well, we have a proportionality constant which is the, the heat capacity storage times the temperature times the volume of our body. So this is L times A, right? Length times the area of a cross section. So, and then per unit area, uh, sorry, per unit volume, we have the small Q, which is just the same law CV times T. Okay, so this is, I think, intuitively clear. The more I heat up a body, the more energy in terms of heat is stored in this object. Okay, and then there's a second postulate, and it this thing, uh, concerns the transport of heat. So, how does the temperature or the amount of heat change over time? And this is what was denoted by Q dot, which is also a parameter lambda times the temperature difference and then times the area 
And one thing I will add, so this is the temperature at the end point. This will be the temperature at the beginning. So as I said, boundary conditions are important, right? This is our T1 and T2. So the heat transfer is the temperature difference over L. So, so the, sort of the, the gradient, if you wish. We, we, we'll get to that in a second, <coughs> times the area. And then there's this proportionality constant. Again, metal transports heat much quicker than, than wood, for instance. And so one thing that is important to note here is if the temperature T2 is higher than the temperature 1, so here it's very hot and here it's rather cold, then obviously heat is transported from hot to cold. This is what we are used to. So what we do need is a minus sign here, okay? So if we have a, a, a positive decrease in temperature, heat is transported to the opposite direction, right? And so again, we have per unit volume, the little q, um, let's write it below here, q dot is again the same just per unit area then, okay? Per unit area. We get Q dot, which is minus lambda T2 minus T1 over L. Okay, and so I took it away already a little bit. This looks familiar. We have seen this when we were talking about explicit Euler derivations. This looks like the difference uh, between two points and then divided by the distance of these two points, right? So what you see is really a sort of a finite difference approximation. <clears throat> and if we now consider this temperature difference everywhere, so let's say we look at an infinitesimally short section of this rod of length ds, then we will see that this becomes actually a gradient, okay? So let's take another color maybe for the ds here. Let's say we take here, the L to zero, okay? So we could put these closer and closer together. So the difference becomes smaller, but the L also becomes smaller. Then in the limit, this will be our temperature derivative with respect to space, okay? I guess this is clear, finite difference approximation for small L, this is the true derivative. And I'm also already using a partial derivative sign because we're going to need the time derivative as well. Okay, so these are the two laws Fourier postulated. And I said we are going to use conservation laws to derive um, the heat equation. So what we need now is, instead of conservation of momentum or, or forces for, for Newton's law, we are going to consider here conservation of energy. Right? And so what do we have? We have um, basically the heat that changes in this system over time can only be influenced by something that goes in, something that goes out, or an external heating. Let's say I apply a heating device somewhere in the middle. Right? But this is a balance that we have. If the heat, the amount of heat changes in the system, it can only be by transport in or out, or by external sinks or sources somehow, but these are nothing we are going to consider. So let's uh, look at it like this. We consider the volume of our system, length times the square, uh, the area of, of the cross section, and then the change of heat over time. Okay, so this is the temperature, or the, 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 the energy that changes. And now here comes the conservation. If energy changes, it can only be due to something going in times the cross section or if something goes out, this is subtracted, right? And then I'm going to add in brackets here, but we're not going to consider this, some sorts of sources or sinks that we might have, okay? If I put some sort of a heating device in the middle, we, I could change the energy level, but this is nothing we're going to consider. Let's, let's look at this for a moment. And what you see now is, first of all, I can divide by A, obviously. Um, and so what I can do is I can rewrite this, which is something I'm going to need in a minute. Um, I'm just going to say that, so dq dt, so the derivative of the heat times the length, minus, so I'm pushing this to the other side, 
q.in minus q.out is 0. Okay, so nothing changed. I divided by a, which I can if it's not 0, obviously. And um, I shifted it like this. And now there's one final step that I need, which is a, a sort of a mathematical step. Uh, something that I guess you know from, from your basic math courses, we are going to consider a Taylor series expansion to put the Q in and the Q out into relation. All right, so a very standard trick in mathematics. So what I'm going to say is the Q out can be described by the Q in plus a Taylor series expansion um, for the derivatives. So the Q dot at the outflow, so this would be my second boundary. I have q dot out here, and I have q dot in here. The q dot out can be defined using a Taylor series by what's going in, plus the change of this, the derivative, um, evaluate at the inflow times the length plus and then terms of higher order, right? One half second derivative times s squared plus a term of third order, fourth order, and so on. Right? So you know a very classical Taylor series expansion. And if I'm assuming now the situation where I'm letting this L become small and in the end I consider this infinitesimally small cross section, then I can eliminate everything that is of higher order because the L square is going to be very small if L goes to zero. So what I can say is that Q out is approximately, uh, excuse me, oh, well, I can do it like this, Q in um, plus dQ dot ds times L. And so what you see, the difference between Q in and Q out is what we see here right away, okay? So what I'm going to do is replace this by using the Taylor series expansion by this derivative. And so what I get now is when I use this equation, and I use this one too, what I get is dQ dt times L, and this one is this expression and also times an L. So I can divide by the L directly. What I get in the end is dq dt plus dq dot ds equal to zero, right? All I've done is combine this and this equation, so I'm finding this. And so now I'm really almost there, all I need is the two postulates by Fourier, right? I can replace the Q by CV times T, and I can replace the Q dot by the derivative with respect to space. And so if I'm using these two, what I will get in the end is what we know as the heat equation. So I have CV times the time derivative of the temperature um, minus, because here I have the minus sign, minus lambda times the second derivative with respect to space, and this gives me a zero, okay? And there we have it. This is the equation that I started with in the very beginning. Um, often what people do is, and this is why I had it uh, differently, people use in terms of their lambda really lambda divided by cv, okay? So this is not an equal sign because then this would mean this is one, but so the, the expression often only has this single parameter lambda, which is then the heat equation as we know it. When the, this is the 1D case, I hope, I know it's, it's a rather lengthy derivation, but I think you get the idea how conservation laws give us these equations. And in the next video, we are going to study how we can use um, this or how we can solve these using a computer, and we will see that there is everything that we learned for ODEs uh, can be very handy and will be used again. So thanks a lot and see you in the next video.